Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, got, got a really interesting topic today. So there's there's a lot of buzz in the news about uh, diversity, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, it, it, I think this is a really uh, interesting topic on inclusion, um, but but not from a compliance perspective. This is not a political topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're really going to talk about inclusion. How do you make your your workplace, your 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 business more inclusive? for employees, for clients, for prospective clients, to, to absolutely give yourself a, a competitive advantage. Uh, and I think this is just something we don't think a lot of, uh, about. Um, I think in payroll and HR, we're so, so used to talking about you know, compliance topics. And when we think about disability, you might think about the Americans with Disabilities Act, the, the ADA, which just kind of stirs up uh, thoughts of compliance. But uh, uh, my guest today, uh, uh, Josh Basil, uh, he's going to help us really unpack about why this could truly be a, a competitive advantage for your business. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to let Josh tell most of his own story. But, you know, at the age of uh, 18 in 2004, uh, Josh suffered a, a spinal cord injury uh, uh, on a family vacation in Delaware uh, that left him a, a C4-5 uh, quadru quadriplegic. Um, but it didn't stop him for, from achieving his goals. His positive attitude, his desire to help others motivated him to form a Determined to Heal Foundation and Spinalpedia.com uh, and pursue a law degree. So, uh, Josh, uh, I don't want to steal any more of your thunder. You've got a really powerful story. I think it could be told better by you. Why don't you, why don't you tell our listeners today a little bit about your background? Sure. Mike, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today with your guests. And just, uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll just dive right into it. So why my journey yeah, started when I was 18 years old. And when I was on that beach vacation, I turned my back to the ocean. A wave just picked me up, threw me over my bogey board, and slammed me headfirst against the ocean floor. Uh, that day, I became paralyzed below my shoulders and woke up in a critical unit in the hospital with a ventilator in my neck, and I was unable to, to speak. The only way that I could communicate at, at that time was by blinking uh, once for no and twice for yes. And it, that went on for about five weeks. And when I weaned off the ventilator, um, I made sure that every word from that moment on would count. And that's when I became an advocate for life. So this was 18 years old. I was a college tennis player before my injury and just loved life, playing sports, chasing after girls, you name it. Like I was. I was just, I was, I was a really happy kid. Um, and then, you know, my life was flipped upside down. And I, you know, I had a choice to make. What, what direction would I move in? And, and so much of, of my spinal cord injury, it felt like a, a reset button where I had to relearn every single thing kind of from scratch and how to do it. And um, I quickly learned that nobody would kind of fight harder for me than I would fight for myself. And that's when I learned to become my own best advocate. And um, after my injury, I kind of fell in love with sailing. And, you know, I do think of life as a voyage. And, you know, it's it's important to recognize that on life's voyage, you can have crewmates, you can have different people along that journey that can help you get to where you need to go. And you don't have to do it alone. But it's key to, to become your own best advocate. You need to be kind of be the captain of the ship. So, you know, early on in my injury, um, I recognized the power of mentors. And I had this one guy, Tim Strachan. Um, so I was injured on Bethany Beach in Delaware. 10 years before me, Tim Strachan was one of five All-American quarterbacks in the country. Um, Peyton Manning and Donovan McNabb were in his class, and he was ranked above both of them. He had a full ride to play for Joe Paterno. And one summer uh, vacation, he went to the beach dove in the water and shattered his neck and became paralyzed. And I ended up connecting with him early on uh, in my injury. And he showed me, he went back to community college, he went to undergrad, he went to law school, he graduated, passed the bar, he fell in love, he got married has, and had kids. And Tim kind of showed me, you know, um, that if Tim can do it, I can do it too. And I kind of followed in his wheel tracks. And, um, you know, I've basically everything he did and I'm excited to say next month I'm um, I'm gonna have a baby boy and become a father and it's just it's it's just um I'm just really excited for every day to wake up with purpose 
and to pursue life with love and energy and, and passion to change for good. So that's a little bit about me. I could dive in deeper with the foundation, but um, definitely want to keep the conversation going with you. I appreciate it. I mean, what I get goosebumps hearing you. Um, and, and congratulations on, on, on the on the baby coming. That That's awesome. So here, here's what I would hope anybody watching today, listening today, uh, uh, thinks about. As we talk about today's topic of inclusion being a competitive advantage, right? How many people like Josh are out there that, I mean, how could you not get goosebumps listening to that, right? In in the smarts and the how articulate and the, just the pure drive and will. Um, those people are sitting out there somewhere waiting to be gainfully employed by someone who will give them a chance. And like, oh my gosh, what what a, what a better company you might have if you could tap into a bunch of Josh's, right? So I, I think I think what an amazing introduction uh, to, to to the to the first topic here. So Josh, as as we're doing research here for this discussion and kind of planning, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't realize, you know, seven million sites. Uh, uh, that are considered accessible. Seven million sounds like a big number, but out of over a billion websites in the world, it's less than seven tenths of one percent of websites are 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 even accessible. Can can you just kind of help? Let's let's have a discussion about this. But you know, what what are what are some of the real low hanging fruit opportunities, and why should uh, why should the website uh, be the first thing that companies think about about creating a, a competitive advantage? And I'm thinking both prospective clients and clients, but also uh, employees, because obviously we consume a lot of stuff on our, on our own intranets and websites. Well, businesses exist because they have a product, they have a service, they have something they want to contribute back to, to society and within their own model of, of bringing in dollars. So no, no business wants to start off by closing their doors to any market. They want to have anybody that's willing to be a customer that wants to be a part of their business journey, they, they, no business wants to close the door to them. But unfortunately, like if you have a storefront and you don't make your, your place of business accessible with a curb cut or with just any different type of way of get, making sure that people can get in your store, you're closing, you're closing that business off to a lot of people that can't get in. Your website needs to be thought of exactly the same because if you don't bring web accessibility into your website, you're making it so that someone cannot see the entire picture of what, what you created on that site. So I think a lot of it is like, if you go to a museum and you're looking at a, a, at a painting, um, that painting right there, if you don't, if your website's not accessible, that painting basically ends up becoming half of a painting where the person with a disability, you know, sees half of the, half of the website but has no idea what's missing. So like, and, and that's one of the scary things about going on a website is if it's not accessible, you don't know what you're missing if you have a disability. And it's, it's just, it's an opportunity to like, if you make your website accessible, to like open the doors to so many more people. Like a lot of people don't understand this or, or, or recognize that one fourth of the US population has a disability. And obviously that's a varying degrees of disabilities within that one fourth population. But that's a huge number. And being able to like really tap into that market and show that you care can be a game changer for many, many businesses where they can increase their numbers by a, a huge market that, that they, they haven't tapped into yet. Josh, can you can you just give us some examples? Cause I, I mean, I, I feel stupid in this area. Like uh, uh, I, I, I suspect, you know, the average, the average business person, the entrepreneur, of a small growing business, the executive at a mid-sized company, uh, um, you know, these guys are working their tails off, just trying to trying to run the and grow their grow their business, right? So they're smart people, but they they don't know this world. And if they if they're not a member of that uh, community uh, that is disadvantaged, they're they're just blind to it. Forgive uh, that's terrible. I mean, they're fun, but they they are they're they, they, they're unaware. They don't know what they don't know. So can you kind of just give a, some a handful of examples about you know, a company's website, uh, the, the different types of, of impairments and disabilities that people have uh, that, you know, most people just overlook. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with mine and then I'll, I'll dive into a few others. So if I go to a website and it's not accessible, 
that that can mean a lot of different things. So whether it's the header or the menus, I might not be able to navigate the site to go to the menus or see a drop down menu and then be able to navigate to that drop down menu to go into the next page that you want somebody to experience on that site. I've had issues of not being able to click on hyperlinks because they, they weren't uh, coded properly. Or you it can be a form where I'm trying to fill out an area to put in my name or my, my, my credit card number. And that form wasn't built accessible so that my Dragon actually speaking voice dictation software could type into it. Um, there, there's a lot of different assistive technology pieces that need to be able to interact with websites. And like, you know, I've, I've gone to, you know, buy, buy a pair of shoes. I was able to navigate the entire website, but then when I got to the end to actually purchase it, I couldn't do it because it, it wasn't, didn't have accessibility built in. So accessibility in many can ways. You what, Josh, can you, like, like what specifically about the checkout process wasn't, wasn't enabled for you? So that, that's one of those with my voice dictation software. The forms were not coded properly to be able to fill in my my billing information, my uh, my, my credit card information, which is wow. businesses want that information to be inputted in properly. Um, so, and it's but there's so many other, you know, a lot of people don't recognize how kind of big uh, and different uh, the disability community is. It's made up of many sub communities as well. So you you might go on a website and have epilepsy. And there can be a, something on that website where there's like flashing lights or blinking and it can trigger, trigger an epileptic event. You can have somebody that has, uh, has a, a cognitive disability and has, dis, uh, has difficulties kind of navigating and absorbing the content of the site or blind or low vision and being able to not be able to see or experience the different pictures on the site and knowing what is that picture. If, if, there, if a picture doesn't have alt text, it comes up as image, 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 or it has, it doesn't give any context to what that story is supposed to be told. And there's, so there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot to a website uh, to make it accessible, and there's many, many abilities. So if you, if you're able to build a site correctly or encode it right from the beginning, you're off to a great start. But then there's also other options because the majority, like you said, there's hundreds of millions of websites that exist today that are not accessible. And then there's options for those uh, uh, those businesses and those websites as well to help make accessibility part of. It's interesting. Hearing, hearing you describe your own experience, like so like a web guy, as a marketing guy, I, I study web analytics and I could just see how a bunch of people like me would look at that and think, oh, we had a shopping cart abandoned, right? So maybe it was cognitive dissonance and just decided against the purchase. So we need to add uh, some trust icons and logos and let them know that we're not going to sell their data. And we could have completely misread it. It was an accessibility issue and we had no clue. So what, what should people like me do when, when studying their sites to study the analytics to, to even know? Like I said, I, I think there's a bunch of people, that, and I'll put myself in this category, we don't know what we don't know. So how can we proactively make our sites more accessible? So first, having this conversation today is so important. Just having some awareness. So like before my injury, um, I knew nothing about the disability world other than that Superman was paralyzed. That's all I knew. I didn't, I didn't have any kids in my class. Um, all, my, all my family members luckily didn't have a disability, but the truth about disability, it's a matter of if it's gonna end every individual you love disability uh disabilities catch up with us all um but with that said what can we do so first having this conversation and then kind of diving deeper into your website finding out where it's at so if, if you go if someone goes to accessibly.com slash ace a c e you actually can run an audit on your website you put it basically your url into that site, uh, into that page, and all of a sudden you have a PDF document that shows you all the areas that you're doing great, and then all the areas that you're kind of missing the mark. And it gives you an opportunity to recognize, oh, I had no idea that that, that footer, that header, that form was not accessible. And it gives you the ability to say, you know what, I, now I can do something about it. 
So, so much of it is recognizing kind of where, where you stand and where you're at within your website. So, so you, you, you mentioned your firm, Accessibility, uh, uh, get, just for the sake of transparency for the audience, we, we do our best. So clearly, uh, you know, Assure is a payroll human resource software and HR services company. Um, but we do our very best to, to make our content just free and educational. Uh, we want to add value to, to small businesses and mid-sized companies' uh, lives to, to help them become better businesses. Um, and so, spirit of transparency, could you talk about what your relationship is to this sure. be? And then also, I, I, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So I've got a little demo that I want to show. It's a, it is a demo of, uh, of, your, of your product, uh, but I just think it really opens the eyes uh, to see what the difference between a normal good old fashioned website that actually looks pretty awesome uh, and, and how some how it might change for to be more accessible for some folks. Absolutely, thanks Mike. So yeah, and in February 2021, I joined on board as the community relations manager at Accessibility. And basically my role is to come in to bring more voices of people with disabilities within the organization so that at all levels of the company, disability is present. There, you can have better conversations. You basically can make sure that, that that voices are not forgotten and you can make a better product at the end of the day. And I also yeah. work with a lot of nonprofit organizations that we're bringing in to, to have these conversations to make sure that we can do something about that web accessibility gap and to get more accessibility on the internet to help people with disabilities. So as an advocate, I, I, I recognized that website, web accessibility gap and that's why I, I was excited to be able to come on board and do something about it with a, a business that really wanted to invest in the future of people with disabilities. So yeah, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. So the, 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 if you if you in, 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 if you're good, I'm going to just show a quick video of your company's software in action, just to give kind of people a, a, a visual what that contrast the before after is for the regular website versus a more accessible website. Anything you'd want to say before I jump into that? Um, no, I'll, I'll chime in afterwards. Okay, all right, so real quick everybody, this is maybe, I think maybe two minutes max is all, uh, just a little clip we're gonna show. The second part of our solution is the accessibility interface, which is mostly responsible for adjusting the user interface and the website's design. These cover about 30% of the WCAG requirements and include adjustments for readable fonts, sizing, spacing, color contrast, cursors, emphasis, and more. Users have the choice between accessibility profiles, standalone adjustments, or both. The profiles at the top bundle together common accessibility combinations that together address a specific disability. The user just chooses the profile that's right for them. So, for example, an epileptic user who wishes to browse a website safely without the risk of seizures can choose the seizure safe profile. Immediately, all colors are dulled and flashing or even moving elements are paused. An option for visually impaired users with the grading eyesight, for example, is to click on the visually impaired profile and then everything will be zoomed in by 100% while making all the colors more contrasted and saturated. Any further adjustments to the site can be made by choosing the singular features in the rest of the interface, either with the profiles or without. After the initial installation, which takes just a few minutes, our... <clears throat> okay. Um... I'll comment first, then then you can go ahead, uh, Josh. I mean, the the thing that just jumped out to me, so so like I, uh, I have a daughter who has uh, uh, epilepsy, and it's there's no, there's there has been nothing scarier as a dad to, than, than than to watch an, an episode, right? Uh, but the things I just don't even think about. I, I, I'm a I'm a digital marketing guy, but I didn't even think about uh, making my website uh, safe for my own daughter, right? So. Uh, uh, so, so thanks for the for everybody indulging in, in the in a two minute vid video. Um, uh, Josh, I have a question. Uh, the speaker here talked about WGAC compliance. Can you maybe just whatever else you want to say about uh, some best practices here? But could you could you tell everybody what you mean by W? What you guys mean by I think I have it right. WGAC. So yeah, so that's the WCAG guidelines, and basically they put out guidelines to help kind of websites and website owners know what what it takes to get to the compliance levels needed to make your website accessible and they've, they've changed over times as the internet has evolved over time 
and it's 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 one of those things that getting getting together with a, a web specialist a web consultant that basically can help you understand those better you can then implement a lot of those um, best practices uh, into your website and getting your any remediation needs up to date or if you build a website from scratch you can make try to meet all those guidelines from the beginning and one of the things that I love most about kind of that the access widget that everybody saw um, on your demo right there was that it's it's all about for me especially with my spinal cord injury it comes down to usability can I use a website can I navigate and experience all the ins and outs of it and the thing that I love about the different profiles and the different options that are available for me I believe it creates a, a superpower it gives me it gives me the ability to to experience a website more so than I would have ever without it. And it's basically that choice, that experience of uh, a customized experience of how am I going to really navigate from, from A to Z and get to the site and then hopefully, you know, buy a product or sign up for a service or experience what that business has to bring value to a customer. And I, I love being a customer. I love being a brand loyal customer when, when a website is, is accessible. I don't forget it. I come back again and again as a repeat customer. And it's so true within the disability community. It's too often we're kind of put on the sidelines, but when we are like treated right and welcomed, it's just, it. the, the statistics are out there that the disability population is the most brand loyal population. And as natural advocates and mentors, we keep on recommending it to all of our friends, our family, our communities of this experience we had, this product we bought. It's um, Sense. from a marketing standpoint, I, I, this disability community is awesome. And, and represents a heck of a lot of spending power, right? Do, do I have it right? It's uh, 490 billion in spending power uh, uh, made up by persons with disability? Yep, and that, that was last year alone, it was $490 billion. So a $490 billion market of the most brand loyal customers that exist because they are so grossly underserved. Um, what an incredible way to stand up from the crowd, right? It's an opportunity. And, and the disability community is hungry for more opportunities. And that's that, another reason why I joined Accessory, and I, I mentioned that it was last year, but COVID, the, 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 our world has changed. Like the internet has become that much more important to be able to access the world, access information. Like if we if we close that door to you know a unique population, especially a vulnerable population that really needs these services more than ever, and you know it's just it accessibility has become that much more important. And we have been talking a lot more uh, in the last five years than ever about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's becoming part of a lot of organizations' culture where they want to do better, they want to have be able to reach as many different audiences as possible. And the best way to do that is to like kind of ingrain it within the DNA of the company. And that just takes a little effort, a little practice. And it's not something that you can ever like flip a switch. And it's like automatic. It takes effort. It's it's like anything of any uh, employee that you have that you want to train and get them to the next level. It takes time here and there. But if you chip away at it, all of a sudden that person has a new skill set that they can build into the future and grow with. So it's there's just a yeah. lot of opportunity here. Yeah, it, 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 it honestly, it's very, it, it, I keep saying as a marketer, it, it's been eye opening for me uh, in preparation for our discussion and just listening to you today. When I think about how many people, I mean, a, a marketer's dream is to find a vein of gold to tap into where you have an underserved client, an underserved market that you can exploit, right? And oh my gosh, what an underserved market that has money, they want to buy services, and they're more loyal than anybody else. It, it, it just it just seems like a gigantic opportunity uh, for for uh, any size business, small, medium, large, to 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 really take advantage of. All right, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to shift gears uh, on us, uh, Josh. So we've been talking about. Uh, Differentiating your business from uh, a, a prospect and a customer basis, right? Uh, the website kind of being 
that front uh, front door for most businesses, if you will, today. Let, let's shift to internal to, to employees, okay? Um, and, and let's talk about, uh, you know, recruiting, attracting talent. Um, when you make yourself, uh, your business more accessible, um, you know, what, what good things can happen and how, and how do you do it? So making yourself more accessible, especially within the employment world, it, it's like any other employee that you're trying to hire, any other talent out there. First, you got to recruit, you got to hire, you got to retain. But the difference within the disability community is you have to do it with in, inclusive practices in mind. So inclusive recruitment, you know, it's so important when you have like your hiring manager that you make sure that they take out any biases out of their kind of their way of, of trying to recruit people because those biases too often close the doors on many people with disabilities. So like even with me, I, I have, my resume doesn't look exactly the same as somebody else's because I had to take a little time off after my injury because of my disability. And that gap in time, and many, many businesses end up using AI software and just knocks out me immediately because I had a gap. Um, and there's, you're rejected by a, by a discriminatory uh, algorithm, not even a human being, right? Yeah, it, it's unfortunate, but it exists in a lot of hiring practices. Um, but, and it's, but there's all those other little things that, that if you can, within the recruitment stage, kind of go about it with disability in mind, you're actually able to really go after that talent pool uh, in, in a very strategic manner and find, find those people. So it's 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 being able to get trained up uh, within those three different levels of, of recruitment, hiring, and retainment. And it, there's so many resources that exist on the internet today that can help businesses go through that and get trained and go through webinars and have best practices, have checklists. There, all of that information exists out there. It's just a matter of kind of putting it within your own kind of employment strategy of getting getting that talent in, into your into your business josh can you give some examples of what uh, like like how do you i mean so your algorithm example but what would be some practical ways to remove that bias that un, unintended i won't say unconscious because this can be a, computers doing this right what but the unintended bias that excludes persons with disability so accurate job descriptions is really important. Sometimes uh, the jobs will overestimate something and say like, you have to be able to carry 50 pounds on your own. And then that basically secludes a lot of people that don't have the physical strength or ability to do that when in all honesty, somebody's not gonna be carrying more than 20 pounds or something of that sort. Um, I think the, the biggest way, and I'm gonna come back to it, is making sure your website's accessible so people can actually you know, apply and learn about your website, about the About Us and all the different projects and initiatives your businesses are doing. Um, and especially even the application, you know, making sure that you have your PDF remediation done so that the, so that the actual PDF document is accessible for people. So there's, there's different layers of making your website accessible, but also the, the application process accessible. And, and then, you know, when you, I just got a to do uh, uh, added to my list, Josh. I'm I'm just thinking. So we use a uh, we use a recruitment product in our own website, recruiting people, and you got to fill out forms. I'm going to have to verify whether you can use uh, speech to text to to complete out to complete our applications. It's it's important, but once you build it into it, it's there, and it's it's it is an ongoing problem. Able to like but it's, it's one like this kind of practice that you do within your business. It, it doesn't it doesn't end up feeling forced. It really just feels like a natural conversation that you that you have. And it's right. um like in the in the late '90s, you know, so bringing security to your website was like was not all businesses wanted to do that. It was like oh this is an added expense. This is going to take a lot of energy and resources. But now you look at every single business has a security aspect built into their practice within their business model. 
and diversity, equity, inclusion, and disability just needs to be a part of that because once you build it into your business, it just becomes so much natural and it's 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 not it's not going to be forced and it's going right. to be it's going to open the door to so many people like so a lot of people with accessibility they, they use it every single day and they love it and they don't have a disability like the curb cuts or the elevators to be able to go up on uh, train stations like whenever i go on an elevator i'm usually next to like two or three pregnant women that are just loving it and just like couldn't live without it there's there's so many things within accessibility that is not just for people with disabilities but for all people no i think uh i mean and it, 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 we feel like every week i have to say this you know this this weekly show we do uh, uh it, it's it's not political we don't lead left we don't lead right we just try to bring the very best information we can to small and mid-sized companies to help them grow uh and stay compliant um but this world of diversity equity inclusion the dei movement uh, regrettably has become quite politically charged, right? Uh, uh, on, on both ends of, of the spectrum here. Uh, uh, but this just seems like, this seems like so not political. This just seems like such low hanging fruit. How could you possibly disagree uh, about becoming more inclusive to tap into a bigger uh, customer pool uh, and a bigger uh, talent pool, right? Absolutely. It's you know, we, we, you mentioned in the beginning about compliance. It's not all about compliance. It's a, it's a smart business opportunity and it's the right thing to do. And it's just gonna, it's gonna make your website easier, your business uh, more diverse. You're gonna, so, so much of even just like being able to hire people with disabilities is that you're gonna be able to retain people a lot longer as well because people with disabilities, when they get employed, like once again, they're brand loyal, they stay, as employees, like they they don't want to leave. I was going to ask you that. Do you have any stats around that? Like, what are retention levels uh, in, in this community? There, there's absolutely studies that have been done that have recognized that people with disabilities usually don't leave a business because let I don't want to say it out of fear, but when they get uh, health care that's reliable and that they have, they can't live without it. Like they they need to have that, and they they stay on the business. That is that is taking care of them, and so many people with disabilities love consistency, and being able to have a consistent, reliable job, they're going to show up day in and day out and do everything in their power to not jeopardize that. Where a lot of people with that are not in the disability world, you know, are looking for that next opportunity to move on and move up, and are will switch to a business at any moment. People with disabilities want to stay in and they want to grow. They want to make it more of a family and a long-term relationship. All of the things that if you're not if if you're not a person with with a disability that you just simply take for granted, right? Like I can I I can take the risk of jumping ship and moving somewhere for 10% more money because if it doesn't work out, I can always jump the ship and go somewhere else in a lateral move. Um, and I don't have to think about things. The things that might make it not work out have nothing to do with accessibility because that's not a problem for me, right? Absolutely, and it's and that, that that's what those public, those studies that I was mentioning have shown. It's just there are like like tangible reasons why people with disabilities stick with businesses and they stick for as long as they possibly can. Is and they they want to grow with that business and they they're just just so so loyal to to a, like they they they're natural advocates for that business when they when they join. Josh, do you have any do you have any data or uh, anecdotes around uh, morale and culture, um, uh, even even branding uh, uh, for with, with for I guess for the employees, but also just companies in general who bring in you know more inclusive strategies. So just being able to um, being able to have a diverse workforce, and what I think truly about people with disabilities and workers with disabilities is you're bringing a healthy dose of empathy. You're bringing a different story to, to the table, to your, your team that creates a different conversation, a different approach, a different way where you're able to see that person with disability approach you know, everyday life and all the different uh, issues at, at, at a work that a, a company is trying to do. People with disabilities are natural problem solvers. Every single day, 
when I wake up, I have to figure out a different path forward to be able to accomplish my day, my goals. And I usually do it with you know a big willingness to try, and it creates and a lot of creativity. You know, I tell a lot of families that I mentor, it's like before my injury, I did I did things one million ways. After my injury, I now do it one million new ways, one million different ways. And it's still fun, it's still productive, it's still full of purpose. It's just different. And you know, yeah. bringing in that different approach, that different angle, you're not only you know strengthening the bottom line of of, of, of having the right conversations and tackling different issues at different angles, but it's it, it rubs off on the other coworkers. Like, and I, I love I love that empathy side because you know being able you know within customer relations and having empathy for the other person on the other line, you know being able to have some uh, someone in the workforce that has a disability, it kind of it kind of lets lets uh lets all the coworkers know that. Life, life is different for everybody, and we, we need to have that love and that respect, and um, bring that bring that to the table. Jeff, what what advice do you give for employers? So maybe, like, I can see some people, some employers, literally being afraid. Like, um, how do I how do I make the appropriate accommodations for someone without and, and finding the balance without being uh, overly kid gloves uh in treatment uh in, in holding a person with a disability accountable to performance at the same time being sensitive and empathetic to their needs i i, I could see this is uncharted waters for a lot of employers what what, what advice would you give to someone considering entering this journey who has never had a person with a disability work for them so from from standpoint of accommodations, most reasonable accommodations uh, cost do not cost a lot of money. More than 50% of accommodations cost less than $500, and 15% don't cost anything. Give, so, give, some, uh, give some examples by accommodations. So a reasonable accommodation can be, and this could be even for like a, a person without a disability. You could buy a certain piece of software that allows them to be more productive. You know, my my voice dictation software. Is a reasonable accommodation. It allows me to, uh, as fast as I can speak, it types for me. I'm able to, you know, write, you know, just lots of things. You know, I I, I was able to graduate magna cum laude from law school with a few different pieces of assistive technology that basically allowed me to create an even playing field, an even playing field to be a very highly productive student. And in my in, in work today, like I, I I I have no problem going 10 straight hours working. Like it's it's, there's a lot of assumptions of people with disabilities that they're gonna be slower or that they're not gonna be able to do all the work, but with technology today and the ability to do remote work, is it's transforming what, what how, how people with any ability can contribute in, in a really highly productive way. And Josh, I'm guessing, and I'm just winging it here, but I'm guessing you don't want to be held to a lower standard. You're you're an overachieving human being, regardless of what disability you may or may not have. Uh, you don't want to be uh, you don't you don't you don't want to be handled with kid gloves. You want to be held to the same, if not a higher standard than everybody else, because you want to show that you can achieve and exceed it. You just need to be asked what accommodations you need. Am I am I reading that right? You so yes. Yeah, so so much of, of of being able to find out what somebody needs is to have those proper communication channels. And you know, it's important to not, I guess, not make assumptions, but rather have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. Turn it into a learning experience. And I'm telling you today, like even with me, I learn something every single day about the disability world that I did not know. And the more interactions I have with people that are that are that don't look like me or function like me or sound like me, I'm I'm always learning. And that's I think that's the beauty of life is that you know, if everything was so simple and you know everything could be filled in with check boxes that would be so boring but being able to integrate more abilities and a, a diverse group of coworkers, you're having those different conversations and you're learning from each other and at the end of the day you're creating a more inclusive world and at this at the same time you know hiring a lot of people with disabilities at all levels of your business ends up giving you more of those conversations that I'm talking about, 
Uh, but at the same time, it creates also that a next opportunity to be able to market around it as well, to show that you care, to share that you're opening your doors to this population. So any business that's hiring people with disabilities should absolutely be marketing the heck out of it. Like it's you, and it, I'm not saying that because because you do it, you pat yourself on the back, do it, but no, market that you care about this community. You do the same thing for any other customer that you're trying to reach and you're trying to create connections. Yeah. You do marketing for something you want more of, right? Uh, so it's interesting, the, the parallels, uh, in the first topic we talked about was, you know, customers, prospective customers, the website, uh, the huge spending power of a ridiculously underserved brand loyal audience oh my gosh, what an opportunity. And the exact same parallels here for employment, right? Uh, a, a terribly underserved, incredibly uh, employer loyal, uh, for all the reasons we discussed, uh, talent pool who wants to be challenged and they want real meaningful work. Um, one of the things in, in, in reading through your notes before our conversation today, uh, they really jumped out to me. I thought it was super cool as, as, as I was thinking about this. I want you to expound. Uh, People with disabilities, by nature, become if they weren't before, they become natural problem solvers, right? Say, say more about uh, this community and their ability to think outside the box and solve problems. So yeah, we it's not doing something with a disability. It usually involves some type of obstacle or some type of barrier. And if you are able to kind of work around that. And I, I wish I actually spoke about this early, but I, I kind of want to tap into that perspective. So first of all, perspective uh, for me uh, is all about focusing on what I can do rather than dwelling on what I cannot. If I always focus on what I cannot do, life becomes a, an uphill battle. So many people within the disability community choose to focus on what they can do because it's more forward moving, but we, we end up using what we have as as our strengths and we find ways creative ways around different problems so like one of the things if you, i can't i can't uh, brush my teeth as i used to so being able to figure out uh how how i'm going to get around that what what things am i going to use to make that happen am i going to need assistance but there's so many like larger level like of being able to get into a building and things of that nature that is a problem that most people don't have to think about when they're leaving their door. Um, but there's there's a million different kind of problem solving techniques and exercises that we have to do. And I think of it almost as exercising your brain. Like the more and more you have to exercise your problem solving skills, which a person with a disability has to do it from the second they wake up to the second they go to bed, you end up starting to get really, really good at overcoming barriers. And yeah. that is an important skill set to bring to any business that wants to think outside of the box. That just makes so much sense to me. I, I heard a speaker recently talk about the only thing today's, uh, I'd say Western society, um, uh, not the United States, just Western uh, uh, economies. The only thing we're deprived of is depravity, right? We, we, we have life so good. Uh, the things that we just take for granted every single day at our, the information at our fingertips and, and you know, we flip a light switch and the lights come on. We go to the grocery stores and, 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 and the food is there. In, in the winter, our homes are, our homes are warm. In the summer, they're, they're, they're cooled. The things we just take for granted are unbelievable. Um, but when you face diversity, when you face challenges and you are depraved of certain resources, you just simply have to figure a way out. And as much as anything, that becomes a mindset in, in, in an attitude in which the way you approach life. Uh, and as, as I'm hearing you talk and I'm and listening to this, I'm like, man, if we had a talent pool of potential employees who had, who were, forget IQ, were just better problem solvers and they didn't wait to be told what to do, what a better company we would have, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's it's amazing when, when I've been able to join different businesses um, within my career and just being able to, to join their team and seeing kind of like the value that I've been able to bring and the appreciation from the executives and the leadership that just, they're just like, the second they get a taste, the next thing I know, 
they're they're hiring other people with disabilities as well because they're, right. they're recognizing that there there is this untapped population this this pool of talent that exists out there that just has not been been given an opportunity a chance and has fallen through the cracks and with with there being so much you know attention on trying to hire and hire more and more talent once again it's just an incredible opportunity right now for businesses to dive right. in dive in and do this right Let, let's so let, let's talk about uh so accommodations so it's one thing if you are you know a manufacturer you need people to come to a central location and build things right and so there are physical accommodations you can make but in you know the pandemic has really accelerated this this mega trend that has been going on for about 20 years uh, around virtual work right uh, in, in remote work um, talk to, talk to us about how uh, and maybe partially uh, accelerated by the pandemic but uh, how, how this shift to virtual remote work is transformed uh, you know the workplace for people with disabilities so I think it'll... First, just I've had I've had bosses over the years that if they didn't see me physically in the office, that quote unquote means I wasn't working. And I mm -hmm. think remote work has changed that. The fact is you don't have to be at your office cubicle or or computer to be quote unquote working. You can as long as you have a computer and access to the internet or or phone, you could be a highly productive worker. Um, but it, with that being said. So much of the barriers for workers with disabilities in the past has fallen on transportation. Not having reliable transportation, or you know, many many vehicles that are that are wheelchair, power wheelchair, or even to be able to get in them and out of them, those vehicles can cost like seventy to one hundred thousand dollars. A lot yeah. of people didn't, don't have the money to be able to purchase those vehicles. Right. And being able, to, some people with disabilities need someone to help drive them and, and don't have the ability to pay someone to be with them at work the entire time so remote work has given people the opportunity to work from home where they have all of the equipment they need they have set up so that they at lunch they can be able to feed themselves or, and go to the bathroom in a place that that gives them the privacy they need or the different pieces of equipment they need so remote work has changed the game for many people with disabilities um, because it's giving them a, a safer and easier work environment to, to really get to day in, day out, and to be there always without any. Even I, I live in the DC area, and you know, before I used to take the metro into work, I would work two up two blocks away from the White House, and that metro was not always working. And if it wasn't working, I wasn't able to jump into an Uber and go straight to work. So it was it was like relying on the metro was not always something that worked well for someone for someone like myself with a disability right right what kind of accommodations do employers need to be thinking about um for virtual at-home work i mean so you, you in your case you talk about dictation software what 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 kind of accommodations should employers be thinking about what kind of expense should they be thinking about um it's just most it's just a lot of people think that accommodation is going to cost an arm and a leg. It's just it, it really, from from what the, the data points are showing um, for hiring people with disabilities, it's there's there's not that great of, of expenses for businesses when they hire people with disabilities. It's really about figuring out what works and allowing that person to, to be able to work at the highest level. And it, it could be as simple as being able to get that software, like I said, or being able, like I have a special mouth joystick right here that I'm able to control my computer with. And that, that little piece of technology allows me to operate at, at, at as fast a speed as anybody else. Or I have sure. a, a special cup right here that I have my water that allows me to, as an accommodation, not have to go upstairs every time I want to get a drink of water. It's right here. I'm actually able to work longer, faster, and more consistently like without with breaks. Um, you know, for me, a, a reasonable accommodation, because I'm in my chair, I do a, a pressure release where I tilt back to, to get the blood, the blood flowing from my butt um, and my back and to relieve kind of my skin a little bit. And I usually do that 
once every hour for like two, three minutes. So asking your employer, can I do a press release for two, three minutes? Like there's a lot of little things like there, but everybody's a little bit different, but it's it's a matter of kind of being open and being like, yeah, we, we want you as my employee to be able to like be comfortable and productive and, and work the hours that we need and, and deliver deliver the outcomes that we want from you as a worker, which uh, most bosses I've, I've met say, I don't care how you do it, Josh, get it done. I get it done. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, the biggest accommodation is not having to write a check to buy a $100,000 accessible van, right? I mean, I mean, you, you probably safe to say, you know, if Josh, if I hired you, you've, you already own all your own accommodations. I just need to not have to require you to find a way into an office. Uh, it, it, and you've got your own internet, you've got your own technology, you've got your own setup. The accommodations may simply be procedural uh, that, that cost nothing or next to nothing. Is that the right way to think about it? I, I do believe that to be true. It's, um, it's, and it's just being able to understand kind of who your, who your worker is and what, what can we do together to, to grow together as a business. So like if there, if there is a piece of technology or something that can allow them to be, you know, work to that next level, that's a, that's a smart investment within that, that worker or whether it's a, a training, a piece of technology, having that investment in them, you know, it pays dividends long-term because that worker is gonna be there for a long time, uh, at least statistically with workers with disabilities. Right, right. Josh, this is this has been enlightening for me. Um, I know when uh, when we internally we're talking about this topic in in in, in uh, uh, you know a few weeks back. I, I, for whatever reason, I I think I I fell into the stereotypical trap that this is going to be a a compliance oriented conversation. Um, and then as we explored the topic of being a competitive differentiator. I thought, hmm, you know what? That could be really cool to talk about, you know, what competitive advantages you have for attracting a, a new talent pool. And when I saw the stats, I uh, got even more excited. But then when I started thinking about inclusivity being just a way to differentiate your company, period, to attract not just talent, but also uh, new prospects, new clients, uh, uh, underserved markets that have money and are brand loyal, uh, boy, the, the, I think there's just game-changing opportunities for most employers that I think so few of us have given enough time to, to think about. Anything you'd want to say in conclusion here? So just, I think this is an opportunity, you know, having your audience today with us and listening to this point, you know, recognizes that they're they're starting to kind of learn kind of different things that maybe they, they didn't know about, about the disability community and what they, what they have to offer, whether it's with within your, as employees, or with opening your website to become accessible. And it's then it's all about kind of learning about scalable solutions or, or different options out there. And with, with Accessibility's Access Widget, the thing that I love about it is it's really, it's a simple approach and a cost affordable approach that allows people kind of, you know, to take the complexities out of web development. A lot of people, when they, you know, try to make their website accessible, they think it's gonna be crazy complicated, crazy expensive. And that's what it was in, in the past. Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be if you approach it in, in a different way. It's like the, the accessibility access widget, and that's the thing I really love, is being able to get on for a cost affordable solution. It just, it changes the game. And it's, you know, the more and more websites that we're able to like reach out to the world and get get accessible, it's just we're, we're, we're changing, we're changing futures. Uh, for, for people with disabilities and even for businesses, making themselves more accessible. So I love that. Yeah, very good. Well, Josh, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Uh, and, and I want to thank everybody else for joining today uh, as well. Um, uh, as most of you know, uh, Assure is a payroll human resources software company that also provides human resource services. So for the company that, that simply needs help navigating these waters, uh, we can be as simple as uh, a resource just to your managers on demand to ask questions. We can be a proactive resource to your organization, helping managers come up with a good talent strategy. Where are you gonna find? How are you gonna recruit? How are you gonna develop and retain talent? Uh, uh, of which 
can include uh, a, a, a diversity, equity, inclusion, specifically an inclusive uh, component to your strategy and how not to exclude accidentally uh, large talent pools. And of course, we can outsource the entire HR function uh, where your employees literally just call our employees as, as their outsourced HR department. Many times employees are more comfortable talking to a third party than they are talking to say the HR manager because they know the HR manager is good friends with their boss and they need that confidentiality to, to really share their opinions and make you a better company. So we can do all this for truly just a fraction of the cost of hiring a SHRM certified uh, HR manager in-house uh, it, and we can we can meet, uh, meet any size company and any size model that, that works for you guys. So if you need help, you want some advice in the area of creating a more inclusive company uh, in, in, in to make that part of your talent strategy, uh, we'd love to have that conversation. Josh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one last opportunity here to tell tell everybody about who Accessibility is uh, in, in, in how that how your company can help. So with Accessibility, Accessibility.com, we're, we're a full suite hub solution for web accessibility. So not just our access widget, which provides all those profiles. And what, one of the cool things about, about it is every 24 hours that that software, that coding scans your entire website and fills in the different, it finds the different holes and fills it in through artificial intelligence, which is in, it's an incredible part of the journey of keeping accessibility going. It's not a flip of a switch. It's it's something you do it day in, day out, and you keep kind of moving forward because your website changes every single day. And um, we do PDF remediations. We do closed captioning for videos. Um, it's There's a lot of incredible options to be able to like work with at Accessibility and really go in there, checking out accessibility.com slash ACE to see where your website stands is a great start. And then jumping on board and seeing kind of what we can do to to help with that journey with you to, to bring accessibility to your website. And one of the biggest things that I, I'd love to say is um, the different agencies of the world that, are, that provide different services to businesses and being able to consult on websites or just all aspects of a business, those agencies in my eyes are the biggest change makers because they have the most touches to the most websites. Some agencies have 100 clients, others have 1,000, 10,000 clients. So being able to get agencies on board to recognize that there's an opportunity to bring accessibility to businesses, not only for that compliance, like we said, but for the smart business opportunities. I think that's when we're going to start being able to see, you know, on a scalable level, millions or thousands of more and millions of more websites to become accessible. And I'm so excited for that future to be able to have, you know, more access all around the internet because it's, it's going to be life changing and game changing for both people with disabilities and, and the businesses that want to be a part of that, that journey. So just Mike, I just want to thank you so much for the invite today and the opportunity to talk about this because I, I definitely believe we're, we're changing lives today. Yeah, Josh, it was a real pleasure meeting you. Your, uh, your story is inspirational and anybody watching, listening today, uh, if you don't have a website or a business model that is more inclusive, you're, I'll say we, we're all, we're all missing out on people like Josh that could be making an impact in our organization. So uh, it was a, it was a heartfelt uh, educational uh, conversation. Josh really enjoyed meeting you and I, and I thank you for sharing your story today. And uh, thank everyone else for joining us today. If there's anything we can do to help in the areas of payroll, HR, time to attendance, HR services, uh, there will be a survey that pops up at the end of this uh, end of this uh, session uh, where you can let us know if you want to talk to us or if you want help from uh, Josh's firm, I would be happy to talk more. Uh, until next week, thanks, Josh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Mike.